Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, this is really, this is always a special question for us because the North American Gas Forum has been going on now for over a decade, and we are thrilled to get together uh, great minds to debate, discuss, and uh, really just connect and collaborate over the top uh, issues of today. Um, this is the first year that we're doing uh, pre-forum workshops, and we're thrilled to be partnering with our energy policy as well as uh, Davies Public Affairs for the first two that today. We are additionally um, really thrilled to be here, of course, because this is our first big forum back after all this time. So. In my opinion, you're part of history, my history. <laughs> um, and I'm just very thankful uh, for those of you that are here and for us to be able to put this on for all of you. So um, without further ado, I'd like to invite our speakers to join me at the top. Um, as they're doing that, again, um, my name is Benna Leslie. I'm with Energy Dialogues. If any of you are here and are not joining us for the North American Gas Forum after and you want more information, either myself or my colleagues at the registration desk at the front can give you more information. In the meantime, we're th I'm thrilled to introduce uh, Bill Squadron with Our Energy Policy, and please take it away. Thanks very much, Benna, and welcome to all of you. Can't tell you how pleased we are not only to be partnering with Energy Dialogues on this event, but to be here live with people in a room. I mean, I think we can all celebrate that and be very grateful that we can do this. Um, and we're looking forward to a terrific discussion today with Paula Glover, who I will introduce in a moment. Um, first, for those of you that are not familiar with our energy policy, OEP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that um, works to facilitate civil substantive dialogue among perspectives from all corners of the energy sector. Uh, and we welcome all of you to visit our site, get involved in our events, both live and online, to take advantage of our energy resource library that's available to everyone through our site. Uh, and to um, become a part of the OEP community, as we call it. Um, what we are going to jump into in a second, I think, will be very interesting and very illuminating because Paula Glover is truly one of the visionary leaders in our industry today. The president of the Alliance to Save Energy. I could go on for a long time about her biography, but I'm not going to. Um, you can read about her, but she has had um, decades of experience in the energy field in different capacities uh, and is truly one of our great visionary leaders today. And to start things off, uh, and let me point out um, as we go through the hour, when we get toward the end of the hour, we'll open it up to questions. So if you all want to jot down notes or anything, if you have a question, um, we'll get to your questions in the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Um, but just to start things off, Paula, um, maybe you can sketch out a little bit of um, your kind of conception of where we're going. There's a lot of rhetoric. There are a lot of goals out there. We understand we're in an energy transition. There are, you know, dozens of moving parts to it. How do you see really being grounded in understanding where we are today and what we have to get to? Sure. So thank, first of all, Bill, thank you for the invitation. Thank you all for being here and for inviting me, Monica. Really great um, to see you after so many years. You know, as I think about kind of this transition, I would just say first, it is a transition. So it's not, um, we're gonna turn one thing off and we're gonna turn something else on. And in the, the time that I've spent in this business, we always talk about our industry as being very complicated. Um, when you talk with customers, when I was at the utility companies, would always say, well, it's really too complicated for them to understand. And I would say that this transition is complicated. Um, and it's incredibly complicated because there are lots of moving parts. Um, here in the States, we're not only talking about an energy transition, whether that's getting off of fossil fuels or addressing climate change, but we're also talking about energy justice and energy equity. We're also talking about grid reliability. Um, we're also talking about net zero. We're talking about affordability. And when you try to deal with all of those things at the same time, that makes the solutions and, and our ability to get there far more complex than I think is described in the media. So um, it is certainly my opinion, um, net zero by 2035 um, 
is not impossible if you have endless amounts of money to spend on it. But if we think about the time that it takes to do permitting and siting of facilities, if we think about how the time that it takes to build new transmission when, where we need it, um, how we upgrade our grid where we need it, and all of those other things, I would say that's highly unlikely And if we're going to do that and keep affordability at the forefront. If affordability has nothing to do with it and we're just going to spend money and spend as much as we need to spend to, to get to this goal, absolutely it's possible. Um, but I don't believe that that's what we really are committing to. And so the transition is, 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 not, is going to be, I believe, longer than anyone has really thought about or certainly anyone who's saying it publicly. Um, I think we who work in the industry understand um, that this transition is, is going to take some time. Um, but we're all collectively working to get there. You know, as, as we think about what is realistic, what's not realistic, um, I know you all at the Alliance Save Energies um, devote a lot of your focus to energy efficiency objectives. And there have been some studies that suggest that we could even, with the right combination of things, um, achieve as much as 40% of the Paris climate goals through efficiency alone. Absolutely. Um, which seems like a very, you know, ambitious concept, but maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So for us at the Alliance, a IEA has said that it's, you could hit 40% of your Paris goals. We could in the United States just do efficiency. But again, that requires a tremendous invest investment in efficiency. So if we think of existing programs that we have now, like the weatherization program, which is funded at about $3 billion. That um, provides weatherization for low-income households. At $3 billion, that program covers somewhere between 35,000 and 40,000 households a year. That's not enough. That, that's just not enough if we, we understand that the need of these households, and that's basic weatherization. So that's windows, doors, insulation, that sort of stuff. Um, and in the efficiency world, when we start thinking about what the future looks like and we're talking about smart meters, smart appliances, um, interacting with the grid, shedding load, demand response, those households who are receiving weatherization are not in the same bucket, right? That means that that investment of $3.5 billion is actually even bigger than that. And you're still only talking about $35,000. Um, so we, we truly believe that 40% is achievable, but again, it is how much investment are we willing to make. And it's not just residential customers, it's um, commercial customers, it's fuel, trans, you know, it's transportation systems, it's um, manufacturing, it's, it's everything. And, and so, again, it's how much are we willing to pay for it. And... Um, despite, I think, what we see in here in Washington about trillions of dollars for this or that, we all know um, that we're really not willing to make that level of investment because um, we're talking about trillions of dollars to do all of it at the same time um, and, to, and to then still have to deal with affordability. Afford somebody has to pay for it. Somebody has to pay for it. It isn't free. And I think we are going to continue to be challenged by this problem problem if we are not, one, honest about that. Just honest about how hard it really is going to be and how expensive it's going to be, and that we are going to be making some choices, um, and that we need to let people know what those choices are. Um, and I would also say we need to let people know what the real runway is. And so if we're not able to even give that words, I'm not quite sure how we really meet these aggressive goals that we have. I mean, it's an interesting point because, in theory, we could reach 40% if we had endless amounts of money to spend um, on this particular segment of the area, but we don't have that, and it may not be the most efficient way to undertake the transition that we know needs to be taken. So as you think about the energy efficiency area and the kind of investment that does make um, economic sense, mm -hmm. how do you kind of... Um, see that unfolding in a way that may not be getting to 40%, but uses the investment we have in the most efficient way possible. Yeah, so for us at the Alliance, we are a federal advocacy organization, so we're always thinking about what are the policies that we need in place to incentivize behavior. We start with tax incentives, um, because that's one tool that we have. 
But even as we think about our tax incentives for residential, again, co commercial and industrial um, sectors, they don't motivate everybody to do the same thing, right? So if you think about uh, tax incentives 25C for residential customers, which would then encourage them to put high efficient equipment in their home, um, it may be $6,000 for insulation, um, it may be $1,500 for a furnace, um, and a high efficient furnace. So this is, I need you to make an investment of six to eight to ten thousand dollars and I'm going to give you a tax credit of fifteen. That may or may not be a motivating factor, but that's kind of what we're focused on. That's a tool that we have. And so for policymakers, they absolutely understand um, the importance of tax credits and tax incentives to spur behavior. But we have this overarching issue that we are now thinking about deeply at the Alliance, which is that not every homeowner um, itemizes when they're filing their taxes. And if you're not itemizing, then tax credits actually don't apply to you. That's an additional challenge. And when we changed um, the tax laws a couple years ago, even more house, less households now itemize actually than before. So now we've got to think about what are the other tools that we use to motivate people to put this kind of equipment in. If you're thinking about small business owners who in some ways around efficiency programs operate like residential customers, they don't have a lot of capital to invest in these kinds of things. What kinds of programs are either utility companies or states establishing that are going to, again, incentivize and help them to adopt these measures? So we at the Alliance um, have a couple of bills that we're really focused on, Open Back Better being one, Main Street Efficiency being the other. Both are designed, right, and, and Main Street particularly, to incentivize and help small business owners adopt efficiency members, um, efficiency measures, excuse me. So with Main Street, if you are a small business and your local utility company has um, a program where they'll pay 50% for you to I don't know, add a furnace, for example, um, upgrade your furnace. This grant program would then match that so that the small business owner would have no, um, nothing that they would have to contribute. It's a great program. People like it. It's in, it's in reconciliation. I know it's actually didn't. It was in reconciliation. Because here's the other thing that we always have to consider in, in Washington is that they're not thinking about, policymakers aren't thinking about, like, how do they pay for my particular things. They're trying to figure out how they pay for everything. Right, so when they're thinking about reconciliation, they're not trying to figure out how do we pay for these individual pieces. They're asking the question, how are we going to pay for this $1.75 trillion package? Who's paying for that? And in that give or take, some programs may get more money, some programs are gonna get less money, everyone has different priorities, and that's what I mean by the complexities of solving the problem, because there are other problems that we're also trying to solve at the same time. Um, so that, so in terms of policy, that's how we're, we're thinking about it. And we're trying to also have a little bit of a look to the future. We are increasingly more digitized in this world, in the environment. And one of what we know in our industry is there is lots of opportunity for connectivity for individual homes to talk to the grid, to be able to manage low demand response. That requires access to broadband. Every community doesn't have access to broadband. Um, and so now we've got to think about how do you ensure that you have middle mile broadband built in rural communities where they may have no broadband and or how do you ensure that individuals um, can afford broadband when they actually have it. So where I live here in Maryland, we have high speed broadband. It is expensive. You know, when I, you know, I'm able to pay it, but when I get my 200 plus dollar bill every day for internet and television, or the idiot box as my parents would call it, it seems a little insane that that's what I'm spending, but I need my internet because I'm working from home, my kid is going to school, all those other things um, that, right, or for our own quality of life. There are a lot of households who cannot pay that kind of money. I mean, that, that's not unusual, and so, if we're gonna have a society that's far more connected and an energy grid that's far more connected and we believe that it will be more efficient if it's more connected, broadband now has become foundational to our business in a way that we hadn't thought about before. 
Um, and we don't build out that infrastructure, someone else builds out that in infrastructure. And so, again, that, that those layers um, really do kind of describe the complexity of what we're trying to accomplish. I still think, though, with all of that, the efficiency is the one of the easiest and fastest ways to get there because those programs already exist. We're not talking about new stuff. We're talking about a lot more money. It's interesting, though, as you think about the impact that efficiency can have on demand, um, when you look at those commercial residential facilities that are so reliant on gas as a principal fuel source, mm -hmm. how do you see the sort of intersection of those two efforts, and how can they maybe interact together in a way that can achieve the goals we have? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think that natural gas is still going to be foundational to whatever transition we make. Um, you know, if you follow even what, you know, we have this 100% this renewables goal that's out there, that's not a 2030 goal. It's just, it's just we're not going to get there. And, and if we really think about what it requires to site and permit large renewable, large-scale solar, utility-scale solar, offshore wind, um, that process could take you five, six, seven years, and it's 2021. It's just not going to happen. And we need to be able to deal with the intermittency of these kinds of fuel sources. And so natural gas, um, which now makes up, I think, 40, 50 percent, is going to continue to become, we're going to continue to be reliant on that. I think the other piece of that, though, is if you think about kind of the conversation we're having about electrifying everything, I don't know how you do that and not have natural gas. I don't know how you electrify transportation, how you electrify all these other things, and at the same time, reduce our dependence on natural gas. Um, so for us at the Alliance, what we think about is how do we use natural gas more efficiently, right? That's important. But I don't think we can get there without natural gas, particularly if we are not building new nuclear and we're not building new nuclear, right? So we, we need something that's going to, to deal with that. And, you know, when you think about how it really plays out, you know, city to city, county to county, rural area to rural area. You know, the federal government and the bill you referred to and the idea of Main Street efficiency, you know, has a huge role. But what about the states and the local communities? I mean, what do you see as the principal policy drivers and also obstacles? Because as you say, I mean, often politics is less helpful than it uh, we hope it would be. Um, rhetoric can sometimes get in the way, but what really should be the focus of states and localities to try to move this forward in a reality-grounded kind of way? I think for, for states, so, you know, look, every state does it differently. So you, we'll, we're seeing, right, on both, both coasts, particularly in California, this real drive for a ban on natural gas, certainly for any new builds, but some are thinking, like, how do we get natural gas out of existing buildings. Um, if you think about what's going on in the Northeast, where we're seeing a ban on new pipeline, right? So not necessarily a ban on new, but we're not allowing any new pipelines, which essentially says no new, no, no more gas, which now, um, and, in, and they've done this in the state of New York. And so what's interesting is how one state policy can impact policies of other states, because when New York decides that there's not going to be any more natural gas pipelines coming through that state, that actually impacts Connecticut, Rhode Island, and states north who are right adjacent to New York and who are relying on that. Um, and as someone who's lived in New England, um, many people are still burning oil. And so we kind of have to ask ourselves, like, what are the choices that we're really making? Um, but New York is in a position where they are in some way making decisions for other states because they're, they're where you're going to get this infrastructure built through. Um, the additional challenge on top of that is that people don't want transmission in their backyard. And, and so, again, if we're going to electrify everything, we have a recognition that we need more transmission um, as well as building more resiliency into our existing grid. Um, I don't believe that we are completely honest about the fact that most folks don't want to see more transmission built. People don't want to see new lines built. So now you've got to figure out where you're going to build this stuff, um, who has the right of way, how long, so, you know, and all that 
that other stuff. And so states have a lot of control and power. And while we're thinking about what's going on at the federal level, we also have to keep our eye out for what's going on at the state level. Here's the other side of it. So I talk about like California and these bans on natural gas. You have places like Illinois where there's been a lot of talk about banning new pipeline and natural gas, and you have many communities, particularly black and brown communities, who are saying, no, we want access to natural gas. We don't want to be cut off from natural gas. We want it, even if it's cooking and heating. Um, and so there's a lot of push-pull in different localities, depending on who lives there, depending on who the advocates are, and quite frankly, depending on who has and who doesn't have. That, that absolutely drives a lot of our political conversations. Um, and so you'll start to see, you know, in the middle of the country, particularly in Illinois, more folks saying, um, and Jesse Jackson being one, who's saying, no, these are communities who actually need natural gas um, because it's too expensive and they need to have an option for something else to improve their quality of life. And so, you know, it is all of that, those complexities, and it, and it just kind of depends on where you're living and who's in charge. The thing about policy that's um, unfortunate and tricky is that it can flip on a dime depending on who's in charge. And so in my, in my mind, and for us at the Alliance, we're always talking about what smart policy looks like we like our policy are nonpartisan. We are a coalition. We work with both sides of the aisle because what we don't want to see is a policy that's enacted in 20, you know, right, in 2021, and then if you get a new administration in 2024, that goes away. That does nobody any good. Um, it doesn't allow us to plan for our future in a way that's really reasonable. Um, but that also means that you have to be far more careful and understanding of what people need and, 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 and what our measures are, right? What's most important? And, and I um, really, in, particularly around affordability, and I stick on that all the time because I'm always thinking, okay, you can have all this stuff, but somebody has to pay for it. And are we okay with bills increasing at a magnitude that's gonna be really big if we haven't figured out the affordability because we've decided we're going 100% renewables in a really short period of time and that's it. Yeah, and the other piece of it, as you say, it's a complex puzzle, is reliability. reliability. Because we don't want to see, you know, certainly like what happened in Texas, you know, ever happen again there or anywhere else, but the specter of not having um, a secure and, you know, consistently reliable distribution system, Absolutely. delivery system is foremost. So when you think about the policymakers that you all interact with and see how they try to balance these things, and we all have climate goals top of mind, but how do the issues of reliability and affordability potentially move a more realistic assessment of how we get from here to there? So I would, I mean, the short answer would be it depends on who you talk to, but if you're talking about policymakers, they understand how all these things interconnect. If you're talking about politicians, they pick the argument that is most advantageous to them at that particular time. That's just the reality of that kind of situation. Um, but I think policymakers, and I'm talking about regulators, whether that's at FERC or EPA or anyone, they understand that we've got to do all this right, that all these things really, really matter. They may have their own particular perspective or guidelines of where they want to go. Um, and our job at the Alliance and other organizations is to educate them on what we think is the best way to do it and what are the challenges going to be, what, what we think the success is, what's the right timeline, how much money do we believe the investment is, um, the investment's going to be required, um, but also very largely like, what, what are the steps that needs to happen? So if we're talking about grid reliability and resiliency um, as we're talking about climate, because in my mind, some of the things, that the, the effects of climate change are here already. We are gonna continue to have 100 year storms every three to five years. We, we don't need to, to start thinking like that's not gonna continue. It is going to continue. And so we do need to think about how do we make our grid more resilient in those storms. We do need to think about how do we ensure that our grid is reliable. How do we ensure that we have reliable sources of fuel um, and resources to create these electrons that we need. 
Um, all of that is going to matter. And, and so I think policymakers understand that. Um, but they have, you know, maybe politicians who, who have a particular goal in mind. And, and they need support, I think, from the rest of us to be able to communicate the way that this is going to work, right? Somebody, everybody needs someone who kind of going to kind of back them up in some way. But when I talk with, say, our, our state local, state regulators, they absolutely understand the, the complexities of this transition um, because they have a different responsibility, right? A state regulator for a utility company has to be concerned about the customer, the company, and the shareholder. And so affordability is going to be really important to them. Um, because they've got to make sure that rates stay in such a way that is affordable for most of their customer bases. At the same time, um, they do need to ensure that those companies get a fair rate of return, however they define that. Um, and then they need to right, keep, all of this, this, keep this transition in mind in terms of their legislature and other stakeholders who are really pushing them to help us get to this transitioned um, energy economy. And as you talk to them, I mean, how do you think they see gas as being part of the mix? Is it as a bridge fuel that helps reduce emissions compared to certain other forms of energy um, as it gets toward uh, zero, you know, emission um, sources? Do they see it more as a factor impacting reliability? Do they see it more as an affordability issue? How do they see gas as part yeah. of the mix as they try to put this puzzle together. I think, it, and again, it depends on who you talk to and where they're located, right? Because every jurisdiction has a different fuel mix, mix um, and so they're going to have different needs. But I think absolutely there are those who see it as a bridge field to this clean energy. There are others who would say, you know, what well, we're always going to need gas and we need to kind of figure out how do we reduce methane and, and do some other environmental things, but that gas is going to be a part of this mix. There are some who will tell you that affordability is number one and I need to, um, whatever I use, I need to ensure that that's affordable to my, the customers that um, I serve. So every jurisdiction is, is different, um, but they all have different fuel mixes within those jurisdictions. And so they're looking at these questions differently as well they should. Um, I would say, though, that they all, I have not heard, um, and it doesn't mean that, th that there isn't a regulator who's ever said it, but I have not heard a regulator who has ever, who has said to me, no more natural gas, right? They, they may say no natural gas in new builds. They may say we want to reduce our reliance on natural gas. They may say natural gas for generation, but I don't want it in homes. I don't want to see it in commercial. You know, they, they may say things like that, but I haven't heard somebody say just we're going to get off gas in nine years and that's the end. Um, regulators know that that's not possible. We don't have the storage technology that we're going to need. Um, for our solar resources if that's where we're moving. We don't, we don't have a lot of other things in place to make that really happen. Which, which I think brings up a really interesting point, which is really what the consumer mindset is as well. Because sure. you know, I was in California last week and driving around and there wasn't a gas station I passed that had you know, less than $5 a gallon mm -hmm. uh, pricing. And then I came back to North Carolina where I live and you know it was probably 30 percent or 40 percent lower but nevertheless um, you know these things are the sort of top of mind kinds of things for consumers the cost and whether they can really rely on um, their flow of electricity and energy yeah. I mean what as you think as you work on efficiency issues you're very close to consumers and kind of their behavior and how they think about it what's your sense of what motivates and I know it's, it's, you can't generalize across everyone, mm -hmm. but what have you seen as, as being the things that tend to be, on a large scale, the greatest motivators for people? You know, so some consumers are absolutely concerned about their carbon footprint, right? And so they're going to act accordingly. Um, other consumers are going to be focused on, like, how much is this bill going to cost me? And, and um, you know, uh, and so I'll share this story with you. I you know, lived in New England for a long time. And when I moved to Maryland, I was talking with a colleague and he kept saying to me, you know, you should go all electric and get solar panels on your house and you can get, um, you know, heat pump and all this other stuff. And I remember saying to him, and I still, I hate that I say this, but I still kind of feel it, which is I had electric heat 
when I lived in Connecticut. I would never go back to Electric Heat. I'm one of those customers, you'd have a very hard time convincing me to go to Electric Heat versus Gas Heat because my previous experience with Electric Heat was horrible. It was always cold. My bills were really, really high. Like, you know, four or $500 a month high. And so I have my own, and as someone I think who's probably more informed than most consumers, you'd have a hard time convincing me to go to this new technology. So now let's think about how we're gonna educate people who don't have that level of information and then trying to convince them. Just like you have um, restauranters who will tell you that I only want a gas stove and that's it. I don't want propane. I wanna see a fire coming out and that's how I wanna cook. And so it is a little bit, you know, every consumer has different interests in some way, things that will tie them to a particular fuel source um, some will just say, look, I want this to be as clean and as cheap as possible. But clean and cheap in Massachusetts may look different than clean and cheap in Georgia that has two new nuclear plants, right? And clean and cheap may look different in Colorado, right? Because their fuel mix is different. And so um, all of that, you know, kind of matters. It, you know, I hate to say it depends on who you talk to, but in some way it kind of does depend on who you talk to because we just all have different kinds of interests in what's going to motivate us and what's going to drive us. The thing that I think that makes efficiency really um, important is that we all want to pay less, right? We all, this whole phrase, this idea of working smarter, not harder, that's how I describe efficiency. Efficiency gives us the opportunity to work smarter and not harder, using our existing resources and new resources. So whether we are 100% renewables or 20% renewables, we still need efficiency in my mind. Um, we still have a country that has an enormous number of customers who have a high energy burden. Um, and for people who aren't familiar, energy burden is, is right the percentage of your income that you spend a month on energy. We have... Um, customers in this country, across the country, who spend upwards of 40% of their income on energy. That's insane. That's insane. And efficiency is a tool that we can use to reduce that burden. Um, efficiency is a tool that we, we should be using to reduce energy insecurity. Energy insecurity is um, customers who make a choice between paying their energy bill and buying food and or medicine. And so every five years, there's a residential energy consumption survey. Um, the last one was completed in 2020. That data has not been released yet. But in 2015, 30% of American households made a choice between paying the light bill and buying food or medicine. And so I always harp on affordability because none of us should feel okay with that. Right? And many households make that choice several months, not once a year. They may make, be making that choice every single month. And so we have to make a transition. Um, that is absolutely imperative because climate is here. But we have to do it in such a way that we are not making it worse for people who are already suffering. And we know that at least 30% of American households are suffering. 40% um, of Latino households um, have deal with energy insecurity and 50% of African American households. And so all these, all these things in this moment um, are, are really thing, items that we need to be laser focused on. Um, the good news is, certainly around efficiency, is that it also it creates economic opportunity, right? Energy efficiency jobs, when, one, energy efficiency is the largest employer in clean energy. Two million jobs in energy efficiency today, and we believe that if we grow efficiency, we'd be hitting about three million jobs. That's amazing. But the other thing that makes efficiency particularly special is that efficiency jobs are located in 99. I think six counties in the country. There are only six counties in the U.S. that do not have what would be described as an energy efficiency job, and so it could be a real economic driver. The third thing, though, about efficiency jobs is that most of this work is done by small businesses. And so as we're coming out of this pandemic and talking about building back better and infrastructure um, and a clean energy transition, and at the same time, we need to right, continue to build our economy, I believe that efficiency is just really well-placed 
to check not all the boxes, but many of those boxes. Are there any of the counties, cities, states that you know, you've encountered that have come up with a program that you know, may be innovative, experimental, something that seems to chart a new path with um, you know, really significant impact that we can learn from? Because sharing best practices across the country is clearly something we all need to do. Is there anything that you've seen that would be particularly noteworthy? I think there are a couple of things that we're starting to see now. I would not say significant impact because I think they're just new programs, so we're not there yet that we can say significant. Um, but there's a couple. There's a pay-as-you-save program that you're starting to see um, amongst some rural electric cooperatives. One would be Roanoke in northern North Carolina, in fact. Um, and what that program does is essentially the utility company is essentially underwriting efficiency measures in someone's household. So maybe someone needs insulation, they need their, their roof fixed, whatever that is. Um, that customer is paying that money back through the savings on their bill. Um, so that's kind of unique because there's no initial financial outlay for those customers. They're going to get that benefit of efficiency, but they're going to pay for it through that savings, kind of like we do for performance contracting of commercial buildings. It's, it's, it's pretty similar to that. Um, last year, Public Service Electric and Gas in New Jersey, which is my home, was my home utility, um, got approval for, I think it's a $1.2 billion um, rate increase that then allows them to install efficiency in public buildings, schools, hospitals, like all of that. What is unique about that problem is that PSEG also recognized that there was an economic impact that they could have. And so part of their rate application made a commitment that they would do workforce development in low, moderate income communities around the state of New Jersey and train individuals to do that efficiency work so that those folks um, who desire um, can have, right, start to build a career in this industry beyond just kind of like a workforce development program where I put you through the paces, you're not hired, you went through some training and you're not any better off than when you didn't go through the training. I think PS, PS is unique in that they're really trying to make that connection between economic empowerment as well as kind of getting these efficiency measures in, adopted. Um, and so that, those are two, but the results, because they're new programs, I don't want to say they're super successful programs and everybody should do it. We don't know yet. I think they will be successful, but I just think we need probably a couple of years of more data to really be sure. Although one of the most interesting things you pointed out is that it's an area where all the talk about green jobs and the opportunities economically for people which, um, you know, sometimes uh, have materialized, sometimes not so much. In the efficiency area, there's very clear evidence that mm -hmm. this is, you know, real economic and job opportunity for people, um, you know, in communities everywhere, I mean, not, not just in one sector yeah. of the country. Yeah. You know, um, and, before, and business yeah. opportunities, because it's not just you know, hiring people for jobs, but creating small businesses, allowing small businesses to grow and thrive in communities. I and mean, we should want that. Um, and then I'll, one more program that I do want to cite, I apologize. So Johnson Controls several years ago established a program, a training program, HVAC, um, to do HVAC repair, HVAC, excuse me, HVAC repair and, repair and HVAC equipment for returning citizens. Um, and so they have a training program in maybe one institution in Jersey, maybe more, where they're training men and women, primarily men, before they are released to, to learn how to repair HVAC equipment. Um, and that does a couple of things, right? So when folks are released from institutions, they have to have a skill um, because otherwise you will wind right back up where you started. Um, but Johnson Controls also recognized that we had a, they had a need. There was a need, right, for folks who had that level of expertise and that certification. Um, and so being able to connect those two things together was unique. And one of the successes that they're seeing is that all of the graduates of that program are not folks who all end up working for Johnson Controls because some of their competitors hire these individuals before they do. Um, and so that's, I think, a way to be really creative, again, meeting a need, um, but two needs, right? An economic need for individuals so that they, when they are released, they do have an opportunity for another start and to do something, um, but also this workforce need that we have. Um, we're going to get to questions from 
um, our audience in just a moment, but I, and I have a lot more questions, but I do want to ask you one more because you referred to transportation earlier. Mm -hmm. And i um, very interested in your thoughts about um, where we are going in the transportation space. Are we moving toward an all-electric vehicle world? Does natural gas have a place to play in that world? Is it a hydrogen um, uh, kind of pathway that has some relevance? How do you see the transportation mix going forward? You know, I think, I think there will be a mix. There's certainly a lot of conversation around electrifying everything and electrifying our transportation. Um, we haven't figured out how we would do that with long haul trucks. Um, so, so there's certainly some gaps in there. Um, but I also think that hydrogen is gonna, is gonna play a part in that. We've got existing pipelines and infrastructure, so if we get the technology right, that can be an opportunity. Um, I, early in my career, we were, we were talking earlier, drove a natural gas vehicle like in 1991, which I actually liked. Um, so I think there's lots of opportunity for that. Again, though, electrifying all transportation does not negate the need for natural gas because we still have to generate this power that these cars are gonna run off of. Um, and that is not going to be, not in the short term, it's not gonna be solar and wind. Those two, you know, it's just not gonna work that way. Um, so I, I don't know what the, what the, where we'll end, but I do think that um, we are in a moment in time where innovation can reap all kinds of benefits. And we actually can talk about it today not really knowing what it's gonna look like in 10, 15 years, because the pace of innovation and technology is so fast that I just have no idea. Um, you know, and, and then, and even with electric vehicles, so there's, there's this additional challenge that we have with electric vehicles, which is not just charging stations, which the infrastructure build, I think, has a lot of investment in making sure that there's charging stations, but it's actual infrastructure in communities that can adopt the additional load of EVs. And we do have quite a few communities that actually can't adopt any additional load um, now. And so what are we gonna do about that? That's what gets back to this. There's a massive amount of investment that's gonna be required. Um, and we have to decide how much do we, are we really willing to spend and then who is gonna pay for all that stuff. Well, uh, like I said, why, why don't we give um, people here a chance to ask questions. We have. Um, someone here with a microphone. Only softballs, so. please. Oh, only soft. Oh, sorry. <laughs> only softballs. Yes. I've got a softball one for you because I drove a natural gas vehicle and I liked it as well. Yeah. Um, do you see a role for renewable natural gas from animal farms, wastewater, landfills in this? I think so. I mean, I I I am not one to pick winners and losers because I'm terrible at it, um, and so there's no need for me to to you know pontificate. But I do think. You know, there are a lot of companies that are making investments in research on renewable natural gas, um, and they're banking that that's going to be one of the paths forward, and so I, I have no reason to believe that that would not be possible. Thank you. Uh, hi, hopefully you can hear me okay through my mask. Um, uh, I'm Anna Pavlova. I work for a company called Carbon Quest, and we actually capture carbon from large buildings where electrification is very difficult. Um, but uh, so I worked with the Alliance to Save Energy for over a decade. We missed each other by a few months. And um, one of the things I appreciated about the Alliance over the years is that um, it, as technology evolved, uh, its um, advocacy has evolved as well to from building envelope to um, energy management, uh, transportation, and so on. And what I'm seeing now in other NGOs and policymakers um, is that we tend to get stuck in certain pathways. So buildings, electrification, this is it. There's, uh, forget anything else. And so I'm curious, how does the Alliance approach um, and find what new technologies are out there that could actually make the case for lower emissions um, as opposed to getting stuck in that one pathway, and how do you um, get that message out to, to the policymakers as things change quite rapidly, I think, in the technology space? Thank you. So, and, well, one, sorry that we missed each other, but they told me it was the Hotel California, and I guess that's true. There's so many people who have come through the alliance. Um, you know, the way that we think about it is that we're not necessarily picking technologies that we think 
are better versus other technologies. But what we're encouraging policymakers to do is to think about what are those things that incentivize um, innovation in technologies or technologies that are kind of ready to go, what are the foundational structures that you need around them? So if we think about um, grid integrated buildings, right, what we need, broad, again, access to broadband is one of those foundational things that we're going to need to really make this happen. And so we at the Alliance, because we are a coalition who have all kinds of members with, as you know, various interests and various technologies that they are focused on um, and committing um, their time and resources to, we just want to ensure that that foundational need is met that, so that all people can adopt. Anybody who wants to adopt can adopt. And that's, um, in my mind, complicated enough that we don't need to go, we don't go that much farther. Um, as you know, right, when you're working with members of Congress, they all have their own opinions and perspectives of what they think should be at the top, rise to the top of the list. And our job is to educate and inform them as best we can about other things that are out there um, so that they are now thinking, I think, a little bit more broadly about what they think the future will be. I'm hoping I'm answering your question. Um, I want to just ask, ask a follow-up to that, Paula, because it's a great point about picking technologies and trying to understand which ones have the most potential. And I thought that the question about renewable natural gas was interesting because how do you see the balance between government um, investment in research, in you know, different forms of um, clean energy versus allowing the private sector to um, be the principal pipeline, if you will, no pun intended, for you know, um, innovation and finding uh, those kinds of solutions that will you know, create a great return on investment and reward and has typically been, you know, a more effective way of finding, um, you know, great solutions. But, uh, and I'm not trying to suggest one or the other, but I'm just curious how you see that balance, um, particularly as we've, you know, just passed a big infrastructure bill and we're debating another, another um, large government bill as well. Sure. So, you know, the 17 national labs that fall under the Department of Energy's purview, um, many of them are doing tremendous research, NREL being one, and, and I'll speak more specifically to N NREL. They have um, what they call the Advanced Research Energy Integrated Systems Program, ARIES, um, of which I sit on the advisory board. And at the, as, as part of a member of the advisory board, right, they're trying to figure out is that if the future is um, a lot of demand response and, and the ability to shed load and for consumer equipment to s talk to the grid and talk to the utility and the utility to talk back to them. They're trying to figure out, okay, well, what's required? How? Because we're not going to have one big system that's integrated across the country. I don't think we will. But we're probably going to have s smaller systems. And so they're doing research now about, okay, well, how, one, how do we think about that? Right, what, what would those small pockets look like? Um, what, what are those dynamics? And then how do, what are the research questions that we should be asking so that whatever is built um, is, is thoughtful? Um, in my participation, you know, I'm always asking questions about, okay, but what's your test community look like? Right, so are you um, doing this research in a community that already has all the baseline foundational things in the infrastructure that they need? Every home is well insulated and, and is, you know, it's a great building envelope. Um, they've got strong access to broadband. Or, or, or are you testing in a community that doesn't have those things? Um, and so that, I think that's the sign of work that the government can do, right? The government can, can, can use their resources so that we can think about how do we build something out that all communities, depending on no matter what they look like, shape, size, where they're located, region, weather, um, that we have an um, adaptability there. And I think there's a big role for government to do that type of research. Um, and then I think for industry, we can look at our individual technologies and figure out how they apply. That's how I think about it. So, um, you know, but we need investment in R&D. And, and, and because we're continuing to invest in R&D, that's why I always hesitate to say, well, this is a technology that will win. Because I don't know. I have no idea what somebody's working on that may really be a game changer. 
kind of akin to, and, and when I'm talking with folks, I always say, what is the equivalent of the cell phone for Africa? Right, what's the equivalent? I have no idea. And when they developed the cell phone, they didn't know that that was going to be the, right, that that cell phone would then leapfrog so that you didn't have to build telephone technology throughout Africa because people had wireless technology. I have no idea what the equivalent of that is, um, but I do think that there is an equivalent. And, and once we figure out what that is and how people adopt it and adapt to it, then we're going to get to see that there may be some other technologies that we haven't considered that would work really well. And can, and can help deliver to these most difficult to reach and marginalized areas. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, other questions? Because I have one more that I want to pose to you before we let um, the hour lapse, and that is having to do with demand, because you touched on it, and it's such a critical aspect of this, which I think often gets overlooked, because, you know, efficiency really, you know, impacts demand directly, but I think the larger discussion often ignores the fact that demand is going to continue to compete with our efforts to reduce carbon emissions and achieve um, our climate goals. And maybe you can address for a minute sort of what's, what's the um, horizon when it comes to demand and how do we think about it when we do all these calculations? Yeah, I mean, I think, right, if we are endeavoring to, for example, electrify everything, then electricity demand is obviously going to increase. Is that, you know, every car. The, what's important though is, right, our efficient use of electricity in that model. Um, we, the, the, the model of, for a utility company, buying enough generation to satisfy their peak load is what, is the model that I'm hoping that we're gonna use, that we can use efficiency to move away from. Um, that more connectivity um, will allow companies to be able to shed load when they need to shed load without customers being impacted by it. Um, so not that, we're not talking about brownouts, we're not talking about, hey, I'm going to turn off your air. Um, but having technology that allows appliances to talk to the grid and for utility companies then to talk to those appliances in a way that doesn't impact people's quality of life, I think is gonna be a critical piece as demand increases. Otherwise, companies are gonna just have to, right, continue with the old model, which is, I've now got to buy enough generation in case to hit that peak. And what we saw in Texas was that even when you plan that way, it does not mean that you may not have a problem. Right, and so we need to be planning for all of that, but I, I just believe that if being able to, to do all of this efficiently in our systems, we, I, I talk about appliances because that's the easiest thing for people to get, but even in our systems, um, weatherizing the grid um, in states that we've never had to weatherize before, right? So if you think about what happened after Texas and there was all this, well, they never, you know, they should have weatherized their grid and they, and they, sh and they likely should have. But to play devil's advocate, who here really thought that we were gonna see sub-zero degree weather in Houston for that period of time? Like, no, you know, there, there is something on the other side where they were like, no one actually thought that would ever really happen. Um, and, and so we've got to plan for the worst, but we have to do it in a way, I think, that we can utilize technology um, to get the most out of what we have now, um, manage our costs the best that we possibly um, can um, and think about a transition that takes all of that stuff into account. I think maybe we have time for one last um, question and if I don't see any, uh, there's something I really wanted to ask you based on what you were talking about. I mean you've really um, sketched out how climate goals, reliability and affordability all have this interplay and added broadband ubiquity to the mix. I mean. We can't do everything all at once. I think we all recognize that. But if you were talking to a state regulator um, or a head of a state energy office and said, well, here's something we can do right now that can really make a difference and begin to open doors to other things that can make a difference, what would you suggest? I would suggest, particularly for regulators, that they would look at the way that they measure effectiveness of their efficiency programs beyond how much energy is saved 
to how many people are participating. I think that's just really important if we get to the future. Moving beyond just, um, you know, early in my career, we had a utility company that I worked for, we had an efficiency program where we would help people swap out their refrigerator. So if you bought a more efficient refrigerator, we gave you $700. Um, and at the end, I, I worked in regulatory affairs. My commission was like, we, we, the program was successful, but they were concerned because there were large pockets of consumers who did not participate in this program. And they couldn't understand why. And I remember just kind of being like, well, because you want them to spend $700 first and then we're gonna give them $700 back, that's why. Like it wasn't, it's, you don't have to be a genius to figure that out, there are not a lot of people who just have $700 laying around to buy a brand new refrigerator when the one they have already works to then wait the 30 to 60 days for the company to send them a check. But the measure of the program was not how many customers adopt this measure. The measure of success of the program was getting those refrigerators out. And so I do think if I, would, if I want to talk to commissioners, what I want to say is think about programs that have mass appeal and how do you get whole swaths of communities to participate as opposed to kind of thinking of big expensive hits. Not that the big expensive hits are not important, but to my first point, if we want 40%, right, if, we, if I believe that 40% of our climate goals can be hit by energy efficiency, and that only happens if every single person is able to adopt efficiency measures, then I want programs that are gonna be measured on their ability to hit all those communities and those households. Yeah. And as you've said, you know, very eloquently, it really is a kind of um, city by city, community by community, town by town, county by county effort. It, this is not a, whatever we may do from the top down, this really has to be done in localities all over the country for it, for it to be effective, which I think is um, a real lesson. And the other thing which I'll put a plug in um, as we close is for the nonpartisan nature of what we all need to think about because when we get lost in the rhetoric and the politics, it's very hard to sit down and look at how complex a puzzle it is and how we can put it together. And it really behooves all of us, whether it's through organizations like the Alliance or through OEP and the dialogues that we endorse or through energy dialogues, we need to keep impressing on the decision makers how important it is to be realistic, be grounded, and come up with a plan that can address all of these goals and move us to a future where we can all be um, comfortable that we are leaving something uh, reasonable to our children and grandchildren. Uh, ben, I just want to say thank you again from OEP. We were uh, very honored to be able to share this with Energy Dialogues today. Round of applause for Paula Glover, please. And uh, I want to wish all of you who are here for the forum a great couple of days and a good week to all. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Um, what a great note to end on as well. I, I honestly can't, I can't add more to that. It is exactly what we all, I think, strive to do. It's what Energy Dialogues wants to do, bring everyone together, cross the value chain to have these conversations both for, um, for, for ourselves, for business opportunities, but really to have that in mind that it needs to be, um, as Bill was saying, it needs to be bipartisan and it needs to be uh, something that we could really build something on for the future. So again, thank you to both uh, Bill and Paula. It was great and thank you all for being here. Right now we have a coffee break outside. Um, some snacks, coffee, water, of course. I guess I probably could have done this. Um, and, and you can too when you eat and drink, uh, just so you know. Um, there are hand sanitizing stations and there are masks that everyone need. Um, and so thank you so much for being here. And we look forward to hosting you either at NAGF or at a future event. Thank you so much. <laughs>